developing both the number and number S variant of an iPhone. Why, you might ask? Well, maybe it's happening because I've gone full mainstream. That is, when I'm not busy running two gaming systems off a single tower like I did in this recent video. Or maybe it's because the 6S is legitimately a really interesting phone, maybe even more so than the 6 before it. What makes it so interesting, you might ask? I guess we'll find out, won't we? V-cell cases are exquisitely finished bumper cases made of wood and aluminum for the iPhone 5, 6, and 6S series products. They're stylish, slim, minimalistic, and just plain gorgeous. Check out the link in the video description to learn more. For better or for worse, other than the new pink color, and yes, it's pink, rose gold, Apple has changed pretty much nothing about the device outwardly. In spite of outcry about the antenna panty lines or the ever-popular rumors about Apple removing headphone jacks or doing away with the physical home button, it is, to the naked eye, indistinguishable to anyone but a member of Cook's cult from the previous generation device, which isn't to say at all that this is the same phone being repackaged and sold to us as if it's new. They really did change a lot. First, there was the knee-jerk reaction to the iPhone 6 Plus's Bendgate fiasco, which was to assure us that the new phone is made of 7,000 series aluminum. Huh. Then there's the really cool under the hood stuff, like Man, this is great. If the S is for speed, then wow, did the engineers ever take that to heart. First, you've got the new A9 CPU, which is lightning fast in single-threaded tasks and even surprisingly competitive with quad and eight-core processors in multi-threaded workloads. Not to mention its chart-topping new GPU, which is useful for accelerating a lot more than games, by the way, with video and image processing workloads both being capable of utilizing a graphics processor. Second, while Apple retains that inexcusable $900 16-gig model, a capacity that cost $500 off contract back in February of 2008, by the way, they have at least acknowledged that RAM has gotten cheaper and have finally upped the ante when it comes to system memory, giving both the 6S and the 6S Plus a bump to 2 gigs for better multitasking, which, coming back to storage, leads to our next S bullet point, the onboard storage. It's noticeable, like day-to-day -day opening apps, switching between them, loading web pages, noticeable that the 6S is fast. And it's too much of an improvement over the 6 for it to be CPU speed alone. But I had no idea why until I read Joshua Ho from Anontech's early benchmarks of the 6S, where he figured it out. Apple engineered an NVMe SSD controller for this new lineup. No wonder it feels so fast. We're talking about a phone with storage that's nearly twice the speed of other flagship devices out there that are still using EMMC. Holy crap! And there are actually a few more S notes before we move on. The AC Wi-Fi now appears to be Wave 2, which resulted in the following speeds compared to our iPhone 6 on a ruckus R710 access point running on a gigabit fiber internet connection. The S6 supports LTE Advanced if you're one of the lucky bastards with service in your area. And the fingerprint scanner is more reliable when covered with grime or water, and it is lightning fast now, like to the point where it's actually kind of inconvenient if you're like me and have habitually wake your phone to view notifications with the home button. They'll be gone before you even have a chance to see them. Enough about speed though, let's talk about 3D touch. Right now, the way it's used in some cases is just kind of a party trick. A really cool, well-executed party trick, but if we're being honest with ourselves, the amount of time that you save force touching the camera app and then clicking selfie versus launching the camera with a gesture like you can do on some Android handsets and then choosing selfie mode is not significant. Where it really got my attention was in Safari, where it legitimately changed the way that I browsed the web, similarly to how tabbed browsing did for me on the desktop. Like, I'm, I'm a skimmer 
So being able to force touch articles or threads in a forum and read now in a new tab or save for later is flipping awesome. And I can see this being used in so many ways because now with force touch, we effectively have three different clicks that we can execute on a single thing. You've got your short, your long press, and then you've got your deep press. And like I said in my 2015 MacBook video, it just feels great to use. Like I complain about crappy vibration motors in phones, but for the most part, the guys that are doing it well have all been doing it the same level of pretty well for a while, uh-uh. This is a whole new level. It's easy to feel while it's next to you. It is damn near silent when it's not next to you, so you don't get that <laughs> noise, with the only disadvantage here being that uh, it's kind of hard to find if you accidentally drop it between a couch cushion like I did. Good thing for me, though, I had an Apple Watch on when I did that, so I was able to ping it with that little feature which is about the only good experience I had with the Apple Watch first gen while I was doing this review. I was really hoping that Watch OS 2 would change my mind about the Apple Watch and I could justify doing a full review of Watch OS 2, but that's not going to happen. Time travel is slower than just swiping through events would be, and the way that it desperately clings to its pathetic battery life makes for a terrible experience. I feel bad for me and everyone else who bought one still. Which on the subject of software, I guess leads us to iOS 9. There's still a lot of random stuff that drives me crazy. Clearing the search field in Apple Maps still requires me to click again to start typing a new address. And that ridiculous multitasking Rolodex thing that I thought we all agreed was bad in Windows Vista. Why is that back in fashion? And, and holy shit, Apple, implement T9 dialing. If you're watching this, it's 2015. Let me dial the numbers that correspond to the names of my contacts. It is way faster than going through the contacts list. And you know what? Some people have more than, you know, 10 contacts, okay? It's way better. On a more positive note, Apple continues their excellent support of older devices, something that many Android users poo-poo, noting that performance is often degraded in these cases. But I personally prefer to having gaping security holes in what was it, something like 87% of the user base out there. So there's that. And on the subject of features, they've added some welcome stuff, like that handy proactive thing when you swipe to the left that shows you, you know, cool nearby stuff, relevant news, that kind of thing. They've got this cool battery life widget for your phone and your connected devices in the Today pull-down. Um, the scrubbing browsing feature in Photos, I absolutely love, especially when combined with the HTC Zoe-esque snippets of live action with a second and a half on either side of the shutter press that go along with your still photos in live photo mode. Those are cool. And then there's about 60 other some odd cool things. This isn't a comprehensive iOS 9 review. Check out the article linked in the video description on iPhoneHacks.com for a more complete list. Back to photos in the meantime though. The rear camera is great but not nearly as revolutionary as you might think given the huge megapixel bump from 8 to 12. I mean to be clear it's very competitive with the Galaxy S6 and the LG G4 but so was the iPhone 6, and if you do a lot of low-light photography or 4K video recording, which, by the way, it records 4K now, which is cool, the lack of optical stabilization in the non-plus model will hurt you. That is to say, unless you happen to be rocking inline skates when it's time to capture a moment. The selfie camera is a big improvement. It's five megapixels now, and I guess having the screen boost its brightness to act as a pseudo flash is better than nothing, but I still prefer the super wide angle lens on the Galaxy S6 for my self portraits. Which I guess leads us finally to the conclusion. You can like Apple or you can hate Apple. I don't care, and frankly, I doubt that they do either, but what I'm tired of hearing from the haters in particular is Apple doesn't innovate. Innovate a new thing to criticize them about. I mean, sure, Apple didn't invent the idea of higher resolution displays being better when they launched the iPhone 4. They didn't invent fingerprint scanners for authentication with the 5S. And they sure as hell didn't invent fast storage being critical for overall system performance with the 6S. But what they did do is implement these technologies in a compelling way in a real product that isn't just a tech demo. The 6 didn't impress me. It was a 
hey, I can make a bigger phone too response to the changing marketplace and did nothing to lead the industry. The 6S, on the other hand, is a striking return to form and takes the place of the iPhone 4 as my favorite iPhone yet. This is a device that has so much to offer that Apple didn't even feel the need to draw attention to the fact that it's just about as water resistant as any other phone on the market. It's a device that I feel like you could buy with confidence knowing that it will last a long time before there is a meaningful reason to need an upgraded iPhone. That is to say, unless they finally decide at some point to compromise a millimeter here or there and deliver a 4.7 inch device with a half decent sized battery in it. I made it through the day without a charger only about 70% of the time. But for some reason, we all accept that aspect of the iPhone experience. So I guess complaining about it won't do me any good. And on the subject of complaints, we've had a few complaints that our phones always have those vinyl skins on them in our B-roll. And so we took those complaints and we burned them in a fire. Today's episode sponsor is dbrand. You head over to dbrand.com, you put in whatever device you've got, whether it's an iPhone 6s or whether it's a PlayStation 4 or like a MacBook or they, they even do game controllers. Those ones are freaking cool. And then you go ahead, you go through their customizer utility, which is awesome and gives you a really great idea of what your device is going to look like. You pay a reasonable price for a high quality vinyl skin and then you pay three dollar flat shipping to have it shipped to you. They've got tons of happy customers. They're one of the sponsors that we get just boatloads of positive feedback about. They've got great customer service and overall we can't say enough positive things about dbrand. So will phones continue to have dbrand skins on them in our reviews? Yes they will. So there you go.